last couple of times. So let's let that start before I launch the, the slides. There we go. <clears throat> so I'm going to launch the slides and we'll have a look. I'm going to make a few remarks um, on these slides. And then um, given the time, I have, I have an activity at the end of these slides that we'll do together. Now, uh, what I've named the title of this is um, Five Reprex Tips for Getting Code Help. Um, and I'm going to explain what a Reprex is. And I'm going to go through a couple of uh, points that I would like to make. And then I would have those five tips that are guidelines for making a good reproducible example when you're stuck on a question. And before I forget to say it, the concept of the reproducible example now, reprex and the so calling of a reproducible example is a it's a bit of a um, jargon term. When you smash two words together, uh, um, well, what what the former president of the United States, George W. Bush, he wasn't very well known for his elocution, but um, he, there was a famous quote I'm thinking of now as he um, he said uh, on entrepreneurism, uh, entrepreneurs. The, uh, the French don't even have a word for entrepreneur. And uh, what I was going to say is uh, <clears throat> playing on that, that uh, it's a portmanteau. The French don't even have a word for portmanteau, but it's a French word that means putting two other words together, uh, smashing them together to make a new word. And that's what reprex is. Reproducible example is what uh, coders and stats nerds and, and uh, anybody online calls uh, when you're asking someone else for help uh, it's it's considered best practice to ask for help with a reproducible example so i'm going to explain what it is go through a few tips but then we're actually going to try it out and th this comes up in our code and in python code too, any programming language but um just here at the beginning i also want to say that um, this kind of thinking is very beneficial for any kind of problem that you need help with, even a practical one completely outside of academia. So I won't come back to that, but um, what I'm gonna do is start with uh, saying exactly what a, what a reprex is. Now, um, what it means, as I said, is it's a reproducible example. And uh, there is a, as you know, a culture, um, in various online communities and there are various expected norms of behavior and when you ask for code help online most of the uh, communities that you may ask for help on they'll be well aware of this concept of the reprex and they will expect you to use a reprex now on slack one of the platforms that we use to communicate for for a little code help and even even here in um, in the Herrig meetings, um, we don't demand people to use reproducible examples, but I, I do mention it here and there, and I, I try to use the kindest way of prompting people to to use reproducible examples as I can, which, as you'll see, often entails me guessing what they're actually asking and then offering back a fully reproducible answer to their non-reproducible question. So. Um, Here's what it is, in my words. It's it's when you're asking for help, and it, and it tends to be online that we're talking about here, that you simply provide enough information to the people or the community you're asking help for, this is the important part, to exactly reproduce the error that you're getting. And I've, I've broken this down in my own words, and I've got some links that are very easy to read at the end that are from prominent people uh, that demonstrate in their words what a reprex is. But um, but basically, that's it. Um, and uh, the complete information part is one of the important steps. Now, when, when we're dealing with um, the master students uh, in the the general stats class. If any of you have um, looked in on some of the questions that we get in there, um, and, I, and I'm, I am aware that there's at least, uh, there's a former master student in here who's graduated and there's a current 
a data science master's student in here right now. There's there's more than one former master's student that's graduated in here. So uh, when I say this, I, I'm not targeting you guys. You're the cream of the crop. You're you're in here already. Uh, but maybe this will sound familiar when I say it that oftentimes the uh, the questions are not very helpful um, to the, the the people asking the questions. They're they're said with uh, the, there's no thought whatsoever um, given to um, providing complete information. Uh, I am an able to answer many of the questions that are flopped out on the table in there because we've been doing it a few years, of course. But um, the minimum that we need is a description of what you're trying to do. We, we can't just have a statement of the problem. We need we need a little bit of a context there. Um, it also really helps. This is one that I almost never get. Um, you have to be fairly skilled to do this, but uh, but you can at least describe it. But it really, really helps when you're asking a question and you're trying to um, do something that involves data to provide a minimal example of what the data is. The least you could do is describe it. But if you merely describe it without getting giving a reproducible example of the data, for example, uh, I may have to make some assumptions about what's what the data object is. If you're trying to do, uh, someone asked a question the other day that uh, was about logistic regression. They were trying to do a logistic regression where the dependent variable is zeros and ones. And uh, I had to ask, and probe a few questions and I said listen can you just print out your own variable I even gave him the code to print out their own variable and show me what you're trying to do and when they printed it out um, it was obvious that all the zeros and ones were in quotation marks they were being treated as a character um, so oftentimes when you're building a, a question with a description of what you're trying to do and you come across um, the challenge of building a minimal data example, you will solve your own problem often, very often, which is one of the reasons why the community demands it online. And then finally, if you've already tried some code, um, by all means, you must show the code. Um, showing any code is better than showing no code. And um, you, you should use the minimal data that you've you know, taken the minimal effort to create when you're asking a question and then provide the code. So providing any information about the code you've already tried is better than nothing. Providing a the actual text of the code is better than providing a screenshot of the code. That's the best because then it's it's if you have the minimal example of data and the code copy paste, you can reproduce the um, the problem and get the answer instantly. Uh, if the person can help you. That's basically the crux of this. <clears throat> it's a lot of text on this slide. I'll read it. I'll read it with you. But this um, this is a real question. That was asked uh, fairly recently in the Slack. And it said, uh, hello. I'm adding legends to my box plots, but I found that if I clear the global environment, this line, and there's some code provided, so okay, it's good that there's some code provided. If I clear the global environment, this line, boom, so it's a legend call to add a legend to a plot, stops working. Now they go on, it adds the legend correctly, if I run the other lines and generate the graph beforehand, but if I run the lot all together, I get the error message. And they paste in the error message. Um, and it says uh, something about there's an error in string width, legend, user. Some of the uh, CEX and font um, arguments are, are just general ones for all plot ob objects. And it says plot new has not been called yet. This, the question goes on. It would seem untidy to me to leave the script for the legend separate. Is there a way to get it to run with the rest of the code for that graph, please? So is this a reproducible example? Well, um, I'll ask this in the hypothetical because we'll, uh, I do have a little problem that we'll work on 
together towards the end. But, uh, you know, the answer is clearly no, it's not reproducible. Um, there are a few things that I pick up on, and I, I think I could try to fix the problem here. But um, clearing the global environment is a weird thing to do. Uh, we clear it at the beginning of a session, but not in between making a graph and a legend. So I'm, I'm thinking that's probably a lot of the problem. I see that um, they're, they've got the coordinates on a graph that are numerical for adding um, the legend in a particular place. And I see that they've got uh, something for a year 18 and a year 17 series of numeric data, I assume. And they've got some fill um, ones. But other than that, I don't even, I can only guess at what kind of plot that this legend is wanting adding to. And um, I don't know exactly what this error means. It would be much easier for me to reproduce it and, and try to problem solve in that way than to try to guess what this error is. So it's often quite I, I do myself Google error messages sometimes that even that I get occasionally, but I, I don't recognize this by heart. So I would I would need to problem solve this. So I don't really understand the question to start with, but I can't reproduce. I'm very far from being able to reproduce this problem. And so it's definitely not a reprex. So my answer to this question was like this. Um, I would need a bit more code about what you're trying to answer and your output. I didn't see the output of the graph. Uh, they said they cleared the global environment in between. I do not understand what scenario would make you clear your global environment. I go on to say between making a plot and drawing the legend on your plot. And now um, I do provide a solution. I don't like this just to uh, my, my philosophy. Some of you, if I say it out loud, I may have said this to you, but if I do say it out loud, I hope you may recognize this. I don't like to only give up problems when somebody comes for help. I like to, even if it's it's a ridiculous uh, question, I like to try to be constructive and, and give some form of solution. So I went on to give a solution. Something like this reproducible example works fine, I said. So I offered up this code where I, I tried to guess what kind of data they had. I made up a variable that was numeric, just in a vector, made with a C function there. I made up a factor with two levels. I noticed that they had two series. Um, now, it, I could have gone and put more detail into this um, and made it a you know year one or in year two or year 2017 year 2018 i could i could guess what they wanted from theirs but i've used a technique here called a minimal data set and it's part of the reproducible example best practice where i want just the minimal example because i won't be able to reproduce their error i'm giving a minimal data set for a reproducible example for something that works when you try to add a legend so trying to give a template for a solution. Then I wrap the variable and the factor in a data frame with a data frame object that I put in an object called data, my favorite data frame name, as you know. And then I call base R box plot, the variable as a function of factor in a typical R formula, data equals data. And I added some uh, colors, red and blue, it's a box plot, so uh, one of the, the first element on the box plot will be red and the second element will be blue. Um, and because there are only two factor levels, A and B, which I, um, I made, it's a character vector note, but I know the box plot will accept a character vector and pretend it's a factor. Um, so again, minimum reproducible data set minimum da minimal data set for the reproducible example. Um, I know that it it will just treat those two levels for the two colors. Uh, and then I've added a legend and um, I have put the legend at the um, X1, which will be the first, it'll be straight up and down for the first box plot, the first box on the box plot. And then I, I know that I've put um, the range one to four so I put on the y-axis up near the top, 3.5. And 
made the legend um, labels A and B. I put the same colors in the same order, red and blue. And I've picked, um, I, I have picked actually a, um, this is unnecessary for a legend for a box plot, but I noticed that the question had a thing about the symbol. So I've, I've actually set a symbol as well. So this is what outputs from my reproducible answer. It's got my variable. I don't have any axis labels on here, so it's incredibly ugly, this graph. The colors are, are candy-colored clown of colors for a box plot. But my point was not to make a beautiful graph with a lot of detail. My point was to make the very fewest lines of code. Let's just go back to the code here real quick. The very fewest lines of code that could uh, be reproducibly done by anybody. So if the student copied and pasted all of this, bam, they could see exactly what I could see. And they could adapt this to their own question and hopefully help themselves, which I believe they did do eventually. OK, so that was my answer to a non reproducible non reprex question. My, it was a my rep reprex answer for it. So a good reprex has five features. There's a little bit of context. What are you trying to do? Uh, or why are you trying to do it? And then, and then the detail of exactly what you're trying to do. In my experience, um, oftentimes we get a little frantic when you come up on any problem. I, it's natural, I do it, I have this too. Uh, but if you just take a breath, and think about, well, what am I actually trying to do and how would I explain it to somebody else? This can go a long way to help yourself in its best practice anyway. So uh, there's also a little bit of a, a cost for the reprex to, um, if, you, if you're given unlimited time to, uh, to answer some question, eventually, given infinity time, you will fully answer that question. But that's not the game here. You, uh, if you give uh, three pages of an explanation, nobody's ever going to read it. You want to give the very tersest, very shortest, just the essentials. And this is part of the philosophy of the reproducible example that it is short, that is easy to consume. And the little burden of articulating yourself is, is on the asker because you're asking for free help at the end of the day. OK. It's also um, a bit for um, what have you tried already? Uh, so uh, we want the code, not a screenshot. We want some minimal data. Um, now the example I'm going to give you in a second, I've, I've demonstrated a minimal data set that had some some data, but um, the data example that I'll give you now is from a built-in data set, and uh, maybe we can talk if we have the time about how to convert an existing data set into a minimal reproducible example, you probably um, want some code along with the data part of the answer so that it's reproducible. Um, and um, you also, if, if there's an error message, uh, you can give the error message, you want to copy and paste it. But if there's a wrong outcome that is not a, an error message, you definitely want to include the wrong outcome and, and what you think the right outcome is. That would that would have already been described in what you want to do or what the correct outcome is. So we would need some um, indication of what the wrong outcome is. So I've got a simple example. This is an active activity that uh, we can talk about. Of of I'm going to show some code in my slide. Now, if you want to, I'm just going to click on the uh, the page again. If you want to look at my script, you can download the R script and look at the actual code, but it's it's very short. So um, I'll also copy and paste it into the chat if if you don't want to be bothered with downloading the, the script. So I'll ask you in a moment to open up R Studio and just play with this very brief code. So uh, what I've done here is I've loaded the Iris data set, the faithful old Iris data set. And you know that this is a data set that's got um, four different measurements of a sepal length and sepal width, petal length and petal width for different species of Iris flowers. 
So it's um, they're all in the species, the genus Iris, uh, and then there are the three species: um, Setosa, Varicosa, and one other I can't remember right now. So if you, um, oops, if you have started an R script and you want to um, follow straight along. You would uh, you would start with that, and then here's the code that's the example. So uh, the first thing that you'd want to do is to um, to paste in that code. For some reason, that's not working. Copy. Let me paste it in in text. Might be better. There we go. Um, so what I've what the the premise of this is is to um, the premise is to um, there are three species of virus flowers and the premise here is that well what if you wanted to do a pairwise test on one of the metrics just between two of the species and uh, the the idea here was to create a subset of the iris data set call it something different called my uh, my underscore iris that um, had had um, all of the, the the two other species but um, you exclude the ones uh, that are virginica so you're picking the iris species not equal to virginica um, now there's an error in this code and uh, that's the error you get when you run this code. So uh, don't don't yell out or anything if you can spot the error yourself. But the first thing is, let's just take five minutes. Um, pull up our studio if you can. Run that code. See if you can fix it. Don't tell us the answer. And what we want to do is we want to go through those five steps for how to make this a reproducible example when we ask for help to fix it. So let's just give people a few minutes to do that. I'm just going to wait a short period of time to see if people want to do it. <clears throat> and if you can't run the code, or don't want to, you can still participate in the second part. So I'm just going to give one more minute when the next minute turns on the clock. Okay, so um, <clears throat> what we want to do is uh, go through these steps, and we can do this. Um, what I'll ask for is, let me just see what I've got on the, uh, the last one. Okay, what I'll ask for is some participation in this from you guys. So um, who would like to tell us the context of this problem? I, I did mention the... Uh, what the context was. We would like to come in and, um, in your own words, put what the context is. And remember, we're asking this, we want to ask it in the shortest way. So could I ask you to um, put the shortest way of saying the context in the chat? <clears throat> We're going to ask for help online. Yes, so one way of saying it is you want to select a group, 
from a variable within a data frame that does describe it. But that could be the context. It's coming close to what you wanted. The next one as well, what you want to do. I think the difference between the context is um, that I would say is um, that the context is the the general question that you want to do, and uh, I think that this hits it pretty well. And then the the specifics of what you want to do is the technical part. So uh, <clears throat> if the context is you want to select a group from a variable within a data frame, OK, then can we get a little bit more specific for the uh, technical explanation of what you want to do? Just uh, put it in the chat. I would like to have a few people try this. There's no wrong answer here. We're just trying to build it. It's a learned skill here. It would be um, nice to see if if you'll participate. How would you put this into technical terms into using some R language of what we're trying to do? Feel free to put it in the chat briefly as possible. Yeah, yeah, maybe maybe that's a good way to say it. I like subsetting a data frame. Yes, I like that as well. Um, I like those uh, and other. Here are some other options. If, if it depending on how how uh, comfortable you are with the uh, jargon in R, as we could say, we're trying to slice out some rows from a data frame. Yes, selecting uh, Elsadig. That's good too. Or or slicing out some rows for a data data frame, keying in on uh, two levels of a factor with exactly three levels. That would be a very specific way using some R jargon. Okay. Now, um, <clears throat> so you're getting the idea. So uh, context and a little bit of detail. Now, what have you tried? Now the um, the answer to this one is the code that uh, I put in the chat. This code right here. This is what I've tried. This is what's giving me my error. Of course, you'd also want to put in the um, the code for loading up the data uh, in this this case. Now, um, in this case, loading up the whole data set with that is okay. It's okay because it's a built-in data set and anybody that has R will have that. But let's um, let's pretend you saw the solution that I gave for a, a minimal example for a data set. Uh, where is it? Previous slide. So I made a minimal reproducible example of a data set with this code. me um, it's doing a weird thing when I'm copying it from this HTML I'm not really sure why it's doing that so I'm just gonna do that little trick where I convert it to plain old text there for you could I have someone give a go to make a, a reproducible data example that would be relevant for this problem asking online with the iris data set let's let's pretend that the iris data set isn't built in how would you make a minimal reproducible example of the uh, iris data set? Maybe, maybe starting with some code like this. If you can play with it for just a second, feel free to put it in the uh, chat when you have something. No wrong answers here. We're just discussing this stuff, so give it give it a go, even if you're not not positive.
we're converting the iris data set to a minimum data set to reproduce this error. We've already got our code, so you want to adapt the data object to the to the problem code. That that's a good uh, suggestion, um, Matt, and it, and it does exploit an existing R tool, which I like too. It, but it still relies on having the data object iris, um, and and also it it would be better if uh, the example minimum example of the code had uh, had uh, three factor levels where you're trying to exclude one, or at least two factor levels where you're trying to exclude the one. That would be ideal. Remember, the problem here is uh, you're asking somebody online for help, and they maybe they don't even have access to R, but they can. They are a good R programmer, and they're on the train, and they can see your your question. So the onus here is to provide enough information about the minimum data set to reproduce the um, the the problem. Anyone else? If you, if you have something, I'll just give it another minute. Then, then we can talk about it. Yeah, some something like that would work. Um, Prismec to uh, make a vector of your own files. I'm just going to. Um, where is my um, my code here? For the minimal just data example. Or, or, but we would, we would have we to have provide, provide uh, a data, data frame with that vector. Perhaps. Yeah, you'd need to add to it, but that's a start. What does George have here? So got a width, got a new width, got a length, got a new length, got a species with three levels, data. Data frame. Yes, this is this is more in the shape of um, what we could use to build a reproducible example. If you've got that code example, we want to tailor your code, George. So yeah, that, I, I I shouldn't have put four numeric variables in the width, new width length. It should be six to match the species. Yeah, I mean, uh, but but the minimum. Here's here's my constructive comments on this this approach that um, you have. Here, George, it, this is the most complete one. Uh, you really would probably only need one, one variable. It doesn't have to replicate the data set. It just has to be just enough to, uh, to be a minimum example. But you have species, and you have a, two examples of each of three levels. That's perfect. Um, it'd be nice if you wrapped the data frame and called it my iris because then you could use that my iris thing in the exact code that's throwing the error. And it would still throw the error were we to do that. All of those, you're getting the idea. That's what you do. It takes a little bit of practice and thinking to do this. I actually think it helps also if you answer questions that people ask, because then you get to pick up on um, uh, exactly what would help you be more efficient without having to make up code yourself to, to come up with a solution. But I do want to show one little trick, one other little trick. For the minimal data trick, you, yes, absolutely. You can, um, the D put is the, is the trick, Harry. You, you've, um, you've got it. Now, D put is an awesome way to, um, to do it. That probably is the easiest for the question to ask, for the questioner to ask. But um, I find that, new people are um, when you're learning R, the output of D put is is pretty scary. So uh, this is a um, just going to make my code a little bit bigger for people to see. And if I pull up the help for D put, maybe I'll make it a little smaller. What this does is it writes a text representation of a of a data object. And if you have a full data set, the um, full text representation will be quite large, but it um, will be complete and be 100% reproducible. So we'll try it with Iris. Um, actually, I'm, I'm going to just try it with head Iris um, so that it um, isn't so huge and ugly. But if we just run it, 
down here, we have some code that can be used to uh, ask our question, and I'm just going to copy that. Put that in there, and I'm going to put it in one called my underscore iris. Then if I copy those two lines, I'll, I'll put them um, here in the chat. You want to try it yourself. But uh, what you'll see when I run these two lines is that I get my iris pop up. And if I just print out my iris um, in the console, then I do just get the head in it. And if I also look at the, um, the class, A, um, whoops, what have I done? If I um, look at the class, it's a data frame. So it's perfect for our purposes. Now, I um, have to say, we've got five minutes left and we have to leave 10 minutes early as we have the um, help session right after this. This is the last week we have that. So I'm just going to go back here for this last little bit. And uh, the last little bit is the error message or the wrong outcome, which we had already talked about. What we usually get in these questions is we usually get some form of this, the context and the what you want to do. Usually it's just a, a little bit of the context. Like the question I posted above is very typical, minimal, and it's not that clear about what they were trying to do. I don't even know what kind of graph they were trying to make. Um, and then they did to their benefit, they did give um, some of the code. Um, they gave some of the code and they did give the um, error message for it. So the last thing that I have here is a few citations. Now, um, the great Hadley Wickham himself has um, spoken out about reproducible examples. It is considered best practice for uh, for people who are serious R users. So the supreme R user by modern standards, the first data scientist rock star, so-called Hadley Wickham, has a post, a GitHub markdown post. You can read in his words, it's very short. It's just like what we've gone over here today. Now Stack Overflow is a place that most people learn for the first time about. And m most of you, if you've Googled uh, for solutions about R, You've probably been on Stack Overflow at one time or another. And uh, there are lots of coding communities for all the languages and all kinds of problems. And there's an R coding community. They have a reputation for being quite mean to newcomers there. Uh, they'll, if you ask a question that's vague and doesn't adhere to a reproducible example, instantly you'll have three or four posts within a few minutes that say, go away. Make yourself a reproducible example. If you don't know what it is, educate yourself. Here's a link to that. And then come back when you can behave like a human. They're quite mean about it. And um, they are super nice and cuddly compared to the, the old R community that was an R message board. So for getting help online for a hard one and read the facts, that's right, because reproducible examples all over the frequently asked questions, that's for sure. Um, I just want to go back here real quick because um, I've got this example script that I've opened in R that you can look at. And um, a thing, I think it would be, it would actually be nice if a few people wrote their own reproducible examples for a problem, or if you could, if you have or have encountered a real problem, uh, practice writing the next error message that comes across a, uh, a reprex for it. If, an, if more than three or four people did it, we could spend the time practicing on this. Next year for this uh, stats class, um, if PhD students or other interesting people are around and would like to, uh, it's not very much money, you're not going to be rich on it, but if you would like to be paid to answer reproducible examples for, for the next year's class, so it'll be around um, starting around November and next year and then uh, 16 hours next fall, you know, this, this is what we do. It's almost all that we do in there. And it would be nice to, um, to increase possibly the support in the Slack channel. That's all I've got. Any final comments or claims or questions about reproducible examples or anything else? 
No, thank you, Ed. Pleasure. As usual, I'll see some of you in just a few minutes on the other side, and the rest I'll see later. I'll talk to you later. Yeah, Discord. Um, yeah, I haven't been on a Discord. That's so new, Harry. Um, we should talk about that. I'll, I'll ask you to talk about that. If you know a Discord R channel, uh, I've never been in one. That's that's too new for me. <laughs> but I'd love to hear about that. <laughs> I'll see you guys later. I'm going to stop the recording now.